Um, on this day in 1996, it was written, was released. I was either yep. 12 or 13 years old. I have no doubt that I like this album still as much today as I did then, which I don't know. Maybe that means that I need to listen to more stuff. But uh, is it <laughs> I, as I good, is it as, good as I, I think, think it is? I think it's held up pretty well. I mean, it's Nas has a handful of classic records, and that's easily one of them without question. And in the grander scheme of rap in the 90s, it was a pretty groundbreaking record and I think set – the tone for a lot of things to come both good things and bad things right. but you know but but for most popular genres any major change in style is going to usher in uh, bad trendy ideas and significant artistic ideas and again i think it was written was certainly an example of that what do you think from it was written if you could spell out some of those ideas and then bridge us to today like what if we were to break like okay it was written the golden age of hip hop is in the nineties. Then we have like really interesting stuff in the aughts, like particularly, obviously I love Dipset. And mm. then say today, you know, everybody from Kendrick to Meek Mill to Drake or whatever. What is it specifically about that album though, that you think set and reset things and maybe is still relevant or not relevant today? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about interesting stuff that was coming out during the aughts, bling era stuff, uh, right now we're in a moment, uh, thanks to artists like Drake, for example, and, and Kendrick as well, you know, any major artist where we have this incredibly deep fusion of not only forms of hip hop, but pop music as well. Like hip hop right now is so incredibly dynamic instrumentally it's more melodic than it's ever been mm -hmm. in a lot of respects a lot of the appeal of the genre comes down less to the lyrics and more to the instrumental and the sonic aesthetics of the songs and the genre um and i think it was written definitely put us on that track to get to a lot of the sounds that we were hearing in the 2000s it's a record that amongst a lot of hip-hop fans a lot of nas heads um it's it's a good record, but it's not seen as significant as his debut. As and Illmatic, it's right. yeah, is Illmatic. And I guess it's understandable as to why, because Illmatic is like the blueprint, not the album, the blueprint, but like <laughs> sort of the blueprint of 90s hip hop in a lot of respects in terms of the tone of the instrumentals and the way Nas was rapping and what he was rapping about. Like it, it was just everything that you know could be 90s east coast hip-hop that could be hardcore hip-hop it was like you know perfected on that album in a lot of respects and on it was written you had nas embracing a lot of smoother instrumentals poppier overtones more melody um instrumentals that weren't as cluttered or as noisy uh you know you could say a lot of the beats off of um off of illmatic were uh were very representative of the urban new york landscape that he was coming from because a lot of those beats are just very busy they're kind of cluttered they're a little claustrophobic it's like right. you're standing in the middle of a you know a busy intersection in new york on it was written there on was so train. much more yeah sure yeah. on a subway whatever but mm -hmm. on it was written there's so much more clarity it's a very clean album and uh, it's, it's very really pristine. cinematic i mean that's yeah, I yeah. Want, and it's funny because that's one thing that i think has kind of gone away like i do think like that sort of like idea that you're an album is like basically a mafia movie mm. that is dissipated to some extent. Like I, I, but then, I mean, when you talk about the kind of fusion stuff and it's funny to bring this album up because I think today, obviously this stuff is so much more produced, but I always wonder, like, do you think the Fuji's the score album and is, is to me in some ways that's kind of like the prototype too, right? Because people like Drake, that's part of what he does is he goes and he says like, okay, like now we're doing Soka. Now yeah. we're doing Afrobeat. And you don't even need to know what he's pulling from. Like people can still just be, you know, focused on his usual kind of like moodiness, which is actually another interesting connection to Nas because Nas obviously mm. not in the way Drake is, but Nas is very moody. <laughs> but mm. uh, what do you think about the, the score Fuji's connection to all of this? No, I think that's one of many records during this point in time that sort of like, you know, set that more instrumentally dynamic and, um, 
of cinematic tone. I mean, if you want a record that came out in the same era that I think uh, sort of serves that purpose even more, it's it's got to be Dr. Dre's The Chronic. Right. <laughs> because that came out in the early 90s. And for a record that early in the decade, is, even still today, it sounds so fantastic. Like every drum hit every synth on that record sounds immaculate and and i think i think it's records like that that you know put the east coast in a position where they're like okay we need to either like get more aggressive go harder or we eventually need to reach a point which i think you know nas did with this record where we're kind of matching them on that level of that production value of that cinematic tone of that melody of those more dynamic instrumentals like we couldn't just like you know, be like Onyx on a track forever and just like give them the hardest boom bap beat and just scream our brains out, you know, which I mean, and that, that was a cool two to three year period, you know, that was, that was a cool trend, you know, and, but the thing is like, as much as we look back on that, that was a trend in and of itself that did get stale, you know, even De La Soul made fun of it on, on a record. Um, I, I forget which song it was, you know, but it's, it's that track off of one of their early albums where like this tracks for all those hardcore acts, um, <laughs> which, uh, which, which again, which one I can't remember, but, but people like De La who before were doing more conscious, more Afrocentric stuff, like a lot of those hardcore acts that were just screaming their brains out that came along, like they thought that stuff was kind of silly. You know, uh, right. of course, probably in retrospect, they look back on it and they're like, yeah, you know, that was a cool moment in time. But in this, you know, arena in time, like these are the artists who are being competitive with uh, with their contemporaries. You know, the, the song on this record, uh, the message, you know, Nas had tracks or rather, you know, bars on that song uh, that originally Tupac thought was about him. And he got pissed and he responded to it in right. song. But originally they were about Biggie because around that time, Biggie had been claimed, you know, to be the king of New York. Uh, because Biggie himself, you know, he was starting to, uh, from interviews I've read, he didn't want to, but he was starting to trend toward that poppier direction as well with Juicy. You know, well, originally, well, Juicy, I, yeah, that's inter- my read was that Juicy is the uh, as the song on Ready to Die that was like, this is the strategic, this is the radio song, which is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Like, and then absolutely, Life After Death is incredibly like it's it's like a lush album. That's honestly yeah. like the only word I could think of. Um, yeah. Real quick, on it was written for somebody. Both, I guess. What is your favorite track on it? And for somebody who never listened to it, although it's hard to imagine, because if I ruled the world, I feel like everybody's heard. But like, what what's your favorite track on that album? Um, again, I would go back to the message because I think yeah. lyrically that track is pretty brutal. It's confrontational. I think it's significant for the time in that it puts a lot of his contemporaries on blast and sort of right. like you know throws this sort of competitive hat into the ring. And I think in a lot of ways. It sort of like puts a stake in the ground, you know, like this is at the point where we're no longer like these obscure figures showing up to, you know, a cipher and just battling each other in person. Now we're like larger than life personalities. And like that's essentially, you know, what he's trying to communicate on that track. And he does it through like what you said, through these cinematic instrumental motifs through these lyrical overtones where he's like, you know, like this mob boss and it's like a Scarface film. I would say that track, if you're looking for something a bit more like, uh, uh, I guess socially conscious and introspective, I would definitely say like a, a black girl lost is a pretty significant track as well. That stands out to me as, as far as like, you know, that's an important song in the Nas catalog, I think, because it's, it's not often lyrically you see him go in that place. No. Um, what, what about, all right. So yeah, I, but I agree and, and, with, and, yeah. one, and one more I'll say is, is Nas is coming. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that, that is definitely one of the more melodic cuts on the record. And, you know, also keep in mind, you know, as a sign of Nas moving in the direction that he was and taking influences from the current state of rap and where it was headed, Dr. Dre produced on that track. And, you know, also keep in mind this this is during a time when there, there is some cultural push and pull between the East Coast and the West Coast. Oh, a lot. And and, and this album, this album came out. I, I had to remind myself by looking it up before I came on today. But this album came out at like uh, several months before Tupac got shot. Yeah. Yeah. You've just watched a Michael Brooks show video, and you can watch all of our full main live shows every Tuesday night at around 7 p.m. Eastern time, and subscribe to get all of the clips you want. We're covering the globe. We're focusing on international relations, the intellectual dark web. We're having fun. We're doing deep dives with a lot of amazing guests. Of course, become a patron for the whole thing at patreon.com slash TMBS, or subscribe to this YouTube channel and help us keep growing 
and get that content out there. Subscribe below.